Ours isn't a perfect world, it's downtown, a gilded toilet where people defecate in the streets, where untreated crazies run amok, where business improvement district dispatchers get stabbed in the back, where residents gleefully attend midnight arson, where cars pin people to walls, where tourists disintegrate in water tanks, where old men get beaten to death outside their apartments. The essayist Dan Johnson paints a pretty grisly image of a city's depraved underbelly here, a place defined by its danger, sleaze and moral indifference. Many cities have areas like this, in fact I would argue that most do, but the majority of people are lucky enough not to experience them too regularly. There are some, however, that feel right at home in these environs. They feel that the turmoil and darkness of their surroundings in some way mirrors their own struggles and inner demons. For such a person, this is their city, the real city, and none exemplify such a person so well as the protagonist of noir fiction. But what is it that makes a work of fiction noir, you may ask, and just how does it differ from the other genres? Well, as is often the case, the answer to this question is not immediately obvious. What is noir and what is not inhabits a grey area, write the editors of Boston Noir 2. Its definition is continually expanding from the previous generation's agreed upon notion that noir involves men in fedoras smoking cigarettes on street corners. Succinctly, because of the evolution of the genre, a clear and appropriately inclusive definition is yet to be agreed upon. An oddly apt comparison lies in a 1964 court case in the US concerning the controversy surrounding the film Le Amant. For its inclusion of a sex scene that some felt was obscene, the public demanded it be censored and the matter was taken to court. It was here that the presiding Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart famously said of pornography, I shall not today attempt further to define the kinds of material I understand to be embraced within that shorthand description, but I know it when I see it. A similar thing, implies Otto Penzler, can be said of the noir genre. If asked to define it, many of us struggle and instead defer to listing a series of visual cliches, silhouettes against alleyway walls for instance, the closing of Venetian blinds, a hero smoking a cigar. We can't define it, but we just know it when we see it. However, there are certainly some characteristics that noir fiction all shares in common. Noir alludes to crime, sure, but it also evokes bleak elements, danger, tragedy, sleaze, all of which is best represented by its root French definition, black. So what exactly are these characteristics? Well, I would argue that there are three in particular. First, and most crucially, is the inclusion of a fallen protagonist. Having protagonists who are seriously flawed and nihilistic, writes Penzler, is a core component of noir works, which, after all, are existential pessimistic tales about people. The blackness in the story does not come from the outside, from a broken lamp in a rundown motel or mystery men in shadows. The real noir, the true darkness, is found in the hearts of our protagonists. As such, the protagonists are not always good guys. Even if they're detectives or private investigators, they're usually marred by some personal trauma or addiction, making them as hollow and empty as the spaces between stars and causing them to hurt the others around them, spiralling in patterns of self-destructiveness. They might beat a crook half to death or intimidate a widow for information, but their actions are driven by a faint nobility nestled within the darkness. Psychological instability is the key characteristic of the protagonist of noir writing, identifies Eddie Duggan, and the point of featuring this psychological instability is to create a flawed but eerily relatable character, and thereby to explore the dark corners of the human condition. It is worth noting, by the way, the use of the word protagonist when discussing noir fiction. The word comes from ancient Greek, derived from protos and agonistes, the protagonists of noir are emphatically not heroes, they just so happen to be the character of most importance. Unlike the Greeks, where their protagonists tragically fall from great heights, in noir they fall from the curb. This leads us to discuss the other type of noir protagonist, the criminals, the bank robbers and the blackmailers. A good example of one can be found in the character of Parker, the protagonist in Richard Stark's novel Dirty Money. In the story, Parker is a mastermind criminal cleaning up after a botched heist he was involved in. At one point, a character implores him, if you leave me here, he'll kill me in the morning, to which Parker nonchalantly replies, so you've still got tonight. The protagonist here, as is typical of noir fiction, is not someone heroic, and certainly not one to be admired, but possesses the requisite character noir that is critical to the genre. 
But why on earth would we root for such a character? Even if they are broken and haunted by the ghosts of their past, if they act unpleasantly, why still care? Well, this is perfectly explained by the second main trait of noir. Everyone is bad. Everyone is dark. The noir is ubiquitous. Megan Abbott makes this point most excellently. Hard-boiled novels are an extension of the Wild West and pioneer narratives of the 19th century. The wilderness becomes the city, and the hero is usually a somewhat fallen character, a detective or a cop. In noir, everyone is fallen, and right and wrong are not clearly defined, and maybe not even attainable. Abbott's distinction here hits the nail on the head and correctly speculates that noir is always set against a backdrop of moral turpitude. In this sense, it petitions the Christian notion of the fallen earth, one characterised by sin and ungodliness, when men act however they please. It is the bleakness of this that both makes our protagonists fit in, and comes to somewhat vindicate their actions. The noirscape of the genre is arguably what makes it so distinct, and in some sense enjoyable. We like seeing edgy detectives vying against institutional corruption and vice in an uncaring city, and we like seeing criminals betray each other for the big score. This is exemplified by the third trait of noir, the asceticization of the noirscape. In order to make the bleakness of the setting more tolerable and scintillating, noir fiction often aims to pollute the surface with things to distract from the bleakness, namely quick-witted dialogue, entertaining characters, and the use of a distinctive idiolect. The problem with putting two and two together is that sometimes you get four and sometimes you get twenty-two, comments the character in Dashiell Hammett's The Thin Man, which shows both the subtle wit and distinctive character voice of noir. Another good example can be found in Chandler's The Big Sleep, whereby the protagonist Marlowe describes a man as such. He wore a blue uniform that fitted him the way a stool fits a horse. It's an amusing sentence, but one that showcases the character's cynicism and disappointment. In the same story, Marlowe utters perhaps one of the most famous quotes of noir fiction. You were dead. You were sleeping the big sleep. You were not bothered by things like that. Oil and water were the same as wind and air to you. You just slept the big sleep, not caring about the nastiness of how you died or where you fell. Me? I was part of the nastiness now. This epitomises the distinctive idiolect of the genre and shows how it, in a sense, both encapsulates and digresses from the tired bleakness of the setting. A final example is found in Hammett's The Maltese Falcon. You always have a very smooth explanation ready, criticises Joel Cairo, to which Sam Spade replies, What do you want me to do, learn to stutter? Again, the point of incorporating these humorous interactions is to trivialise the true darkness of the story's environment and tacitly encourage us to forget the questionable character of the protagonist. Interestingly, Abbott's earlier distinction between hard-boiled crime and noir wishes to potentially exclude Chandler and Hammett as noir writers. However, I believe that their fiction certainly meets her definition. The characters surrounding the protagonists are as fallen as the protagonists themselves, and although the detectives play the noble role of knights, they are flawed and tarnished nonetheless. Irrespective of whether the fiction of Chandler and Hammett are solidly noir, one thing can be agreed about the stylism of the genre. It makes doom fun. Hopefully now you have a better understanding of what noir fiction really is, and are better equipped to know it when you see it. Although the genre is difficult to describe, it is best characterised by the presence of a fallen protagonist, a fallen world, and the aestheticization of this setting, the combination of which allows the story to navigate the theme of human vice, whilst remaining entertaining to an almost comic bleakness. As James Elroy wisely remarked, the thrill of noir is the rush of moral forfeit and the abandonment to titulation. And I'm afraid that is the end of the video. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, found it interesting, or just fancy a couple double scotches at a downtown bar, please show your support for this video by liking it. Additionally, if you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel. It's free and a great way of helping more people see our content. Another great way is by sharing our videos with friends. Don't forget there's plenty more content on the channel, please do have a digital wonder, and remember to hit that notification bell so that you know whenever we release a new video. As always everyone, thank you for watching.